and welcome to this episode of the Fortnightly Dispatch, brought to you by the Baker Street Irregulars. I'm Steve Doyle, and I'm your host. Well, it's really wonderful to be back. This is the first episode of Season 3 of the Fortnightly Dispatch, and we had quite a long way off. We concluded Season 2 um, at the end of October or something like that, and now we're back in uh, at the end of January when all the... Holidays are over, all the festivities for Sherlock Holmes' birthday, no matter where you might have observed that, whether it was in your, at home or in your home science society or on Zoom or in New York City. If you were in New York City, um, you know about um, our guest that we're going to have today. Um, and uh, let's just get to it. Our guest today is Glenn Marenker, um, Sherlockian. Uh, collector and uh, all around great guy. And I just, we're just going to jump right into it. Glenn has an exhibition at the Grolier Club in New York City, and he's sharing a subset of his outstanding collection uh, with the world. And um, so let's get to it. So, welcome, uh, Glenn, to the show. It's really good to see you here today. And um, I'm really grateful for you joining us uh, on the Fortnite. Oh, I'm, always, I'm, always, I'm always pleased to see you, Stephen. Well, it um, means, means something good and, and likely Sherlockian is about to happen. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so um, we'll start this like we always do. Where are, you, where, where are you coming to us from today? Where do you live, Glenn? Well, um, uh, Kathy and I have a place in Manhattan. Uh, it's on uh, Central Park West, pretty far north. And we're both um, uh, avid, cons you know, uh, New Yorkers. So we most we mostly live in San Francisco. It's where we pay our taxes, and uh, but we spend a great deal of time in New York. So that's where I am. Great, but you're in New York, you're in New York today. Today, yes. Great. Now I'm sure that you're there. Um, uh, staying close to your exhibition which we'll talk to you about shortly um the um so glenn you you have an interesting personal history to me and i um i'd like to talk to you about it um you were um on the ground floor of apple computers is that my understanding anyway? no that's not that no, that's not that's 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 actually not correct. I went to uh, Apple in 1996 with the second coming of Steve. You know, he had, uh, shall we say, left the company uh, and pursued some other interests. You know, for example, he he founded a company called Next Computer. Mm -hmm. uh, I had run hardware development at Next when uh, Apple uh, acquired uh, uh, Next. Uh, uh, Steve gave, you know, kind of sort of disappeared shortly thereafter, thinking who knows about what. And he decided in the um, uh, early 96 that uh, he was going to try and save the company. And he started gathering up folks that he knew. Uh, I was among them to, uh, to help them with that. So I actually joined Apple uh, in uh, March, of May of 96. I remember the next computer. I remember seeing, actually seeing one demoed somewhere at some trade show or something, and it was, it was great. <laughs> my, my, guys design, my guys designed it. Yeah, I remember. Um, yeah, that was kind of, it was revolutionary. I do remember that. So well, um, next, next, next itself split into two pieces. Um, uh, the software and the hardware side. The hardware, the hardware uh, uh, company was uh, hardware assets were sold as a uh, as an independent company, and I was one of the assets, so I went along <laughs> with, with that hunk. Uh, the the other half, the software, persisted for another few years and was subsequently purchased by Apple, uh, and uh, from that was the genesis of OS X that is the, the next operating system, gave rise to OS X. Uh, but I was, you know, out by myself for a while with this, you know, brand new company uh, for, a, for a number of years. Uh, 
till 96 when I got a call from Steve. That had to be, that had to be a pretty exciting time. Well, I had, um, we were uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the hardware company that sp uh, spun out, um, was uh, fairly rapidly acquired by the uh, Motorola Computer Group, and um, not being terribly successful. So I, um, um, with you know appropriate notice, um, I, uh, uh, resigned, and had resolved I would take you know six months, a year off to you know recharge, regroup, regather my thoughts. And I was, uh, oh, I don't know, three or four days into this uh, six months to a year, uh, Sunday, and the telephone rings. And I pick up the phone and he goes, uh, hello, Glenn. I go, is that Steve? Yeah. He says, yeah, it's Steve. He said, well, what are you up to? And I said, well, you just sold the company, so on and so forth. Uh, wasn't sure what I was going to do, but um, uh, I thought to take off a good long chunk of time. And he says, well, that's a stupid <clears throat> idea uh, and um, not, su not suitable for tender ears. He says, I want you down here tomorrow afternoon, Monday, tomorrow afternoon to explain to me why you're not working at Apple. Um, and hey. so, I, I, so, I, so I, well, I, I, I knew Steve well, well, that was about the end of the conversation, but I certainly knew Steve well enough to know that an acceptable answer was not something like, well, nobody made me an offer, or I don't know what Apple's up to, except uh, well into the process of going out of business. Um, and uh, so I, I went down Monday afternoon, and we, we had a chat about a product that Steve had an idea that would be the uh, kernel for uh, along with a lot of other changes, a huge number sure. of changes, would be the kernel of turning the company around. And that idea was this machine called the iMac. Yes. And, and I agree. We're going to show on right now, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Not that so, idea. Uh, <laughs> no. So, I love the iMac. Everything. So thank you, Glenn. <laughs> It's my main tool. Well, <laughs> well, well, I left. I, I, I left Apple in two thousand and four, uh, and you know, it, with the exception of the iPod, uh, any anything that uh, consumed electricity and had an Apple logo was was designed by my guys. Wow, that's awesome. That's amazing. Well, um, that's. I mean, I could talk to you the rest of the show about that, but we do must we must move on to Sherlock Holmes. Um, but I am grateful because the iMac is the most elegant machine I've ever worked on, and it's wonderful. So, um, the uh, how did you find Sherlock Holmes? How did I find him? Well, yeah. in a manner of speak, in a manner of speaking, he found me. Uh, I'd, I I had read a, a good number of the stories. I no recollection of certainly not all of them. I have no recollection of of just how many when I was a you know little boy. And uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, I was uh, uh, in my room in a funk about something. You know, I'd been turned down for a date or thought I blew it. You know, one of the cosmic undergrad uh, undergraduate events. Mm. And my roommate comes back and he grabs this big fat book, which were the, um, uh, the collected uh, Sherlock Holmes adventures. And he tosses it at me and says, here, read these. It'll cheer you up. And I started reading them again and was absolutely captivated. I, I was just magicked off to, uh, you know, Victorian London and these, you know, wonderful characters and uh, uh, was, uh, you know, bowled over by the, by the, by the stories. Um, reasonably quickly after that, um, I, by luck, uh, stumbled in, uh, uh, stumbled into a couple of uh, local uh, Sherlock Holmes societies and, and discovered there were these, for me it was a discovery, there were these groups of like-minded, very interesting, very companionable uh, uh, people. And so I fell in with a bad lot. <laughs> never so, escaped. <laughs> and, 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 and never <laughs> escaped. Exactly. Do you remember what group uh, it was? How, I mean, how did you come across them? I was, I asked very, because the community, I'm always very interested in our community. And um, 
because every once in a while you still come come across somebody who is a huge Sherlock Holmes fan with no awareness that he, you know he has like minded companions out there. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, except for a chance encounter, I, I certainly had had no idea. But I, um, uh, one of the faculty members at at the college uh, I was in, uh, we were talking about Sherlock Holmes, and he said, "Well, you know, uh, Yale had had it's been fallow for a number of years. Uh, Sherlock Holmes Society called the Bullpups of Yale, and uh, he and another fellow, David Musto." passed away quite a while ago he was yeah and uh said come on glenn let's revive the uh bull pups uh so this was i don't know 73 74 and um you know credit to uh, uh david musto and harry scammell the bull the bull pups were revived and uh i was a worker bee i was part of that so that was the very my very first uh, uh, Sherlockian society. That's great. I'm always interested in hearing that story. So now I must ask you, how did you, um, well, you know, many of us are collectors. We are uh, accumulators and acquirers. And um, did, when did you get the, because, you know, people acquire books throughout their yeah. life. But I do think there's a distinction between acquiring a Sherlockian library and collecting a Sherlockian library, collecting Sherlockiana. And um, I think collecting sort of implies a pursuit. And, yes. Um, when did you cross from one side of that aisle to the other? Well, that happened, to, that happened a, 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 a couple of years later uh, in graduate school. Um, I had, uh, I, I was absolutely, by, by no measure was I a collector. I had, you know, I had the two volume double day. That was it, I had nothing else. I had my reading copies of the stories and uh, it hadn't uh, crossed my mind that this was an air, a, a collectible area. I, I had no collections at all. And certainly Sherlock hadn't crossed my mind as a collectible area. And, um, uh, Kathy and I had been fairly recently married and we're in uh, living in Cambridge uh, I was at uh, uh, MIT a graduate school and one Saturday she went out for a walk for some fresh air um, I was no doubt back home grumbling you know and working away on my thesis or something um, when she returned, she, 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 as luck would have it, she had tumbled into an uh, antiquarian, antiquarian book fair, which was uh, being held in the basement of the Gutman Library. That's, that was the Ed, that's the Ed Library, <clears throat> excuse me, the Ed Library at Harvard. And um, she comes back and says, I brought, I brought you a present to cheer you up. And she hands me a uh, American first edition of the case book of Sherlock Holmes. And something went off in my brain and I'm looking at this book and I look up at her and I, and I said, gee, you don't have to be JP Morgan to collect books. It was, it was a new, <laughs> it was a new idea for me. Um, and I asked her where she got them and it got the book and so forth. And she described it to me and I said, Jesus, it open on Sunday. And it was, of course. And uh, so we took a walk there the next day. And we walk into this antiquarian book fair, and she, very modest. There were maybe, oh, I don't know, a dozen dealers. Uh, uh, they all had like one or two card tables in front of them. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, she escorts me up to this particular card table. And behind the table is the dealer, a fellow named Peter Stern. And in conversation with Peter Stern, this this other fellow, Dan Poznanski. <laughs> and so yes. at the same instant, uh, I was introduced to Peter and Dan and the idea of collecting. Wow. So that's, that's when a, it started, that moment. That's a, that was a big day. 
Well, it was it was a huge day, and uh, uh, the two of them have become you know lifelong friends. Uh, uh, certainly, my my closest friends. Certainly, my I won't say oldest. I'll say longest time friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, uh, and they were they were you know generous uh, with their time, their knowledge. Uh, I can. Uh, very truthfully say they, they, they were my mentors. They, they taught me the ropes. Well, that's so cool. I think, you know, Sherlockians are generous by nature, really, I think. And that that's gift, been my experience. Yeah. And that gift they gave you, you've share, you're sharing now with other people. You have been through the things that you've been doing. Um, well, I think, just I think forward, you know, I, I well, I need I, I I need a better vocabulary. I need a different word. I you know I think I think a real collector. I think that's a responsibility. I mean, responsibility sounds onerous and so on and so forth. I mean, it's it's, it's fun. It's rewarding. It's a joy. But I think it's one of the things you must do. Uh, 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 part of meeting your uh, uh, custodial stewardship obligations is to spread knowledge to uh, 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 spread uh, the, the uh, visu- visual notice so people know what these important things actually look like and where they might be found and why they're important. Um, yeah. So it's a joy, uh, but it's something I feel you know, strongly about is, is something we, we should be doing. I like that you use the word stewardship because really that's what we all do, right? I mean, you say you it's only them. it's only in our possession for one way or another mm-hmm. however however it, it gets dispersed we all die right and it goes someplace else right but that responsibility while you are steward is that uh you save it from whatever state of oblivion it's in because let's face it a lot of this stuff is you know someone doesn't oh, get very- you know, it's going to end up gone forever. And then... Yeah, well, it's memorable. I mean, my, you know, everybody listening to this knows this, but, you know, just casually consider, say, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Beaton's Christmas Annual. Those, were, uh, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but those must have been published in the hundreds of thousands. Mm-hmm. And what are there now? 36, 37, 38 left. Very ephemeral. Uh, and... Certainly, it didn't occur at the time for anybody to preserve them, and the results show themselves. So, all the more reason if you find, I mean, Beaton's, Mrs. Beaton's is a particularly uh, um, uh, ridiculous example, but if you manage to collect one of these things, the uh, proper care, preservation is uh, a responsibility. Yeah, I. I- I agree. I think that's really uh, interesting. I've never understood people who collect whatever it is they collect. And they sort of sit on it like the smog, the dragon, you know, and never just possess it and never. That's, I have. It I, or, you know. yeah, no, we both have heard any number. I don't personally know any such, if you will, collectors. I don't, I, I don't get it. You know, we also hear about, you know, collectors yeah. with collection it is, uh, in a in in a bank someplace, not in their homes. Well, right. Like yes, I, you know, exactly. What, what's the what's the joy? I want to. I want to live. With, yes, I want to live with my books. I want when you know, know, not it's not as often as I would like, but when you know uh, a like-minded person visits and they show an interest, um, I said, you know, let's go look at some stuff. Not yes. oh, I can show it to you. It's in the bank. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's fun. <laughs> we go into the bank. <laughs> no, it's no. I get. I, I don't get it. But, um, well, that just you know, I was going to bring this up a little bit later, but it kind of is a natural segue. So, right now, in New York City, at the Grohl Eater Club, you're sharing just a part of the treasures that you have. Um, yeah. with us. So I've seen this. I saw this uh, exhibition in person in New York City a couple of a week or two ago at this recording. And I have to tell you, Glenn, 
I had the urge to come home and bundle all my stuff up and throw it in the dumpster. <laughs> because well, that was, that's certainly not. I the, got over that, but it was, <laughs> but it was, I'm telling you, it was, it was so tremendous and so well um, exhibited too. I mean, it, you could just walk into any one of those windows and just, just be lost in it. And any one of those windows would have been worth the price of going to see this thing. But there were what, uh, eight, 10 of these display cases that were? Uh, yes, the ten, there are uh, uh, nine display cases. Yeah, and just gobsmackingly um, filled with, with stuff. Um, you can see them as we talk about, talk about it. But um, like I said, this is just a fraction of your collection. How big is your collection? Do you have an idea? Because sometimes it's hard to know. I, I, I have a reason, uh, <clears throat> reasonably precise idea. Every time I acquire something, um, I record it. And uh, I, 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 understanding now, uh, or for a while, what a catalog is, I hesitate to call that list a catalog. But it has, it has uh, what the item is, if it's a book or magazine, bibliographic information, uh, where I got it, if I hear a story about the item at the time of acquisition, I, I record that, the price that I paid, and so forth. Um, and so this invent I have this inventory, and this inventory has just under 8,000 items in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the reason I'm not giving you a precise answer is because there are an interesting number of entries which are not a single item. For example, the BSJs read 1946 to present. You know, that's one entry uh, in, right. in the inventory, but it's about 8,000 items. Yeah, well, that's, that's amazing. Do you, do you still have your original complete Sherlock Holmes? Oh, yes. No, I have, I have, I have, I have a couple of things uh, which I've retained uh, 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 Honestly, for sentimental value, you know, mm -hmm. certainly, certainly the two volume double day. That was my reading copy. Actually, it's still my, <laughs> my reading copy. <laughs> um, and um, the, uh, the case book that Kathy got me, uh, I've had a, an extremely fancy uh, slip case made for it. It's, it's an ordinary U.S., no yeah. dust jacket, no inscriptions, no nothing. Uh, but Price it's very to you, though. Well, it, and it's in, a, it's in a very nice slipcase, and the label on it reads, the world's most expensive book. <laughs> Look what you started. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, the, I, I don't recall exactly, but it was like, you know, $20 to, 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 to get that, but what it caused was ruinous. <laughs> Uh, wow, so yeah, so great. I have I have I have the <laughs> two volume old day and I and I have that case book, and awesome. I'll never go anywhere. Hey, Glenn, let's take a break for a moment. We have to hear from our commercial sponsor. Okay, we're back. How did you, what was the criteria that you picked to display? Well, yeah, great, it's a great question. And, and, and when I describe it, it's going to sound like a very linear, you know, process. Um, but uh, the, well, the first thing was I, I realized because of the exhibit, and because where the exhibit is, it's not just for Sherlockians. Mm -hmm. So the, so as a way of, of, first step as a way of limiting its scope, I was not going to do writings about the writings. I was not going to do society publications. I was not going to do uh, uh, pastiches. Um, uh, whether one agrees or not, I said these are a little, a little too, tan I thought too tangential for a general audience. Not, a little inside would, baseball. Um, uh, not that, aren't, I mean, I collect them. I think they're, you know, extremely worthy and interesting and, and so forth. Um, so I, I'm really down to uh, the Sherlock Holmes stories um, and uh, fairly, well, 
almost immediately I hit on the catchphrase, you know, Sherlock Holmes and 221 objects, you know, independent of what was going to be in the darn exhibit. I figured that. Um, and, uh, and also I, I, I had a rough idea of the, uh, uh, number of cubic feet that would be at my disposal. And so 200 or so was about as much as you could manage. I mean, you see in the exhibit, as growing exhibits goes, it's very crowded. Um, uh, more, more typical is uh, a number like 100 and 150 at, at an exhibit in the main hall. And I very carefully explained to the folks that uh, that would be that would border on impossible to do and i assured them i was making these paper templates of the case at my home and you know laying the books out on the floor and yes it really is going to fit and don't worry um uh, but awesome. but as i was as i was doing that um uh again refinement 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 it it it, it became i wanted one of the things in my collection is I, I uh, the, the, my collection tells stories, tells stories about the about the writing of the book, of a book, of a tale. It tells uh, stories about what was going on in Arthur Conan Doyle's life. You know, building Crowborough, he needed money, um, for example. Um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, publication history for many of the books, many of the stories, is is interesting and. Uh, uh, not patently obvious. You go into a publisher and you give them the book. The, the publishing world was not that orderly in, in uh, the 19th and early 20th century. Um, so I wanted to tell some of those stories, uh, which in a sense was straightforward to do because that's that's been guiding my collecting. Uh, not from the get-go. It took me quite a few years before I was sophisticated enough to both uh, hear this message and then adjust what I collected to, to be consistent with that message. Uh, but having done so it, uh, as a, a, a set, not a unifying, but as a set of unifying ideas, uh, it lent a lot of, of, of structure and so forth to the exhibition. Um, it became uh, apparent that uh, would not be able to cover the entire canon. And so I chose uh, to uh, end it uh, with the return. Yeah, I so, yeah. um, so I chose to end it with the return. Um, uh, honestly, what comes after the return from these other points of view is not all that interesting. So it wasn't that big a sacrifice, so to speak. I want us to talk about some of the specific items in, in the collection. For instance, the ones, one that just had me um, enthralled were, were the adventures in dust jacket the the case with the dust jacketed volumes now the only the only image i've ever seen of the adventures in dust jacket was that poster there was a famous poster uh yes and known and as known as blue alone it, it, it was known in some circles as the blue poster the blue poster Which I have fact, one back by there. the way well it's actually a catalog i yeah. don't know if you've looked at the uh, at the other side but there are a dozen or so inclu including that book there are a dozen or so books listed for sale with their prices on the other side of that yes i so remember it's one of mark Heim it's one of mark Heim's catalogs that's the only place i've ever seen one in a dust jacket and i um and I don't know. Is that one of these? Was this? Uh... No, that is that is that is that book. That's what I uh, figured. As 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 far as uh, a number of people, including myself, have been able to determine, that's the only copy of the uh, uh, Adventures uh, jacket, and it appeared magically in. I think it was the late seventies in Chicago in one of Larry Kanetka's uh, uh, stores. He, he, had a, he had a series, as far as I know, he had one store at a time, but he opened these J. Stephen Lawrence and Lawrence Ware Books. So sort of serially he, he had these books. That serial, yes, yeah, serially he had these books. And he gave, he, he had a, a batch of interesting books that came in and he gave Mark Heim 
in 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 LA a call and Markheim went out to see the to see these books and uh, one of them was this copy of the this copy of the adventures uh, in jacket uh, Markheim uh, uh, purchased the book and um, not to go through the step by step, but uh, it eventually, uh, he put it up at auction, I think it was Sotheby's, and he was there uh, representing a new collector of, a collector customer of his at the auction, um, a fellow named Mark Hoffman. Does that ring a bell? He was, he I mean, was the Mormon forger. He's presently in Oh, jail right, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, wow. and, yes. And as the as the as the FBI agent who eventually caught him said, he is the most gifted forger that's ever been caught. And uh, but a, a long story, but the, 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 a short version of it was his uh, finan Kaufman's financial woes were catching up to him. Nobody knows for sure, but the theory is he wanted to take a little attention and heat off him. Uh, and so he built a few bombs and started blowing up some people. Uh, all in salt. <laughs> right. And uh, he was presumably on his, you know, with a went with another a third bomb uh, on his way someplace, and it went off in his car. Uh, and the immediate reaction was, "Oh, this is yet another poor." Uh, 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 Mormon churchgoer, another victim of this mad bomber out there. Eventually, it was determined that no, Mark Hoffman was the bomber. Mm. Yeah, I do and, remember that story. Uh, as I say, he's in he's in jail right now. Mark Hoffman had a, um, uh, a personal collection of what he considered children's books. And among the children's books were uh, a number of Sherlock Holmes books, including this Adventures in, in Jacket. And As if the book uh, didn't have a pedigree interesting in its own right, then you've got this kind of tossed in as well. <laughs> so that's... Oh, I, lo I mean, I love books like that. You know, for another, another book, not, ne not, not, not anywhere near as dramatic, but it's also part of the exhibit, is there's a uh, pirated copy of the sign of four uh, uh published in 1894 uh uh by the united states book company and it's inscribed by arthur conan doyle and uh as all as as many many book people know and certainly Sherlockians know uh the authors were shall we say, hostile to these pirateers because they published their books without permission, without paying, or most often very, very low budget productions. I mean, pr you know, price to mark, price of the book was absolutely critical for their markets. They, they, they were in business because they could sell books for paperback books for as cheap as, as pennies, mm -hmm. uh, hardbound books for as cheap as a dollar. Um, this was not their intent, but they actually did a substantial public service because uh, uh, ordinary people could afford to buy books. You know, a, pro a, a right. properly bound book, legitimate, you know, legitimate book from probably would be four, five, six, seven dollars, which was a day's wage for a, for a laborer. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, they could afford something other than, you know, the Bible and a newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, so at any rate, uh, so the question arises, why, how, why, where on earth Conan Doyle signed this pirated book? And uh, uh, a big clue was on the uh, paste down, on the, un on the end paper, not the free end paper, but on the end front end paper of the book, there's an ownership signature, Harlow N. Higginbotham, uh, and the date, and a date, presumably the date he bought the book. So a little sleuthing and uh, the uh, and poking around in the online newspaper morgues, and I discovered that Harlow and Higginbotham was a significant uh, Chicago worthy 
end of the last, end of two centuries ago, end of the 19th, he was one of the founders of the Marshall Fields oh. Department Store. He was one of the founders of the uh, Field Museum. Uh, he was wow. the president of the um, 1893 oh. Columbia, the World's Fair, the Columbian Ex Ex uh, Exposition in Chicago. Uh, a, a beloved uh, philanthropist. And uh, Conan Doyle made, a trip, he made his first trip to the United States in you know, 1894. And one of his stops was in the Midwest, a great deal of time spent in Chicago, in the, in the uh, newspaper morgue, in, the, in all the Chicago newspapers, the particular one I used with the Chicago Sun, uh, which covered all the important social events, said um, uh, the appropriate date <clears throat> yesterday at the Bijou Theater in the elegant Higginbotham Mansion, uh, the distinguished British author, Sir Arthur, Arthur Cannon Doyle, not Conan, <laughs> Cannon Doyle, uh, uh, gave a talk and, and was, you know, uh, I was there for a festive dinner. So those are all the facts. My supposition is that Higginbotham saying, gee, the guy's coming over for dinner, ran out to the bookstore, una unaware that this was a pirated copy. Uh, you know, got the book and, and, and Conan Doyle was too much of a gentleman to tell him, I don't think so. And just yeah. inscribe the book to him. I mean, it did, it did say yeah. something about Doyle. Yeah. I cool. agree. Sorry. I, well, I agree. Believe it or not, Glenn, we're getting, our time is flying by. So I want to, I want to get to a couple of specific questions. Now, I'm, I'm, I have the, impression that a lot of your collecting activity happened pre-internet this was all oh yeah absolutely when, when, when collecting was work you know i mean and talk a little bit about how it's changed how you think it's changed nowadays well Stephen, when the internet when the internet you know first came to life for a good long time uh i refused to use it for collecting I had the things that I did to do for diversion and for relaxation and to exercise, you know, other chunks of my mind. And, uh, and then there was the internet. And so for a number of years, I just flat refused to use it. So the, um, uh, uh, it was, it was, it, I went to a talk at about this time by Columbia now in, now in uh, UVA. And his talk was a very stirring talk about collecting. And at the time, he said, uh, hunting for books on the internet isn't book hunting, it's shopping. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, uh, but after, after a handful of years, I said, you know, I'm really cutting off my nose to spite my face. It's, it's uh, uh, nowhere near as re rewarding. You don't learn anywhere near as much. You certainly don't make any social connections. Uh, but to eliminate it from the tools that you use to help you assign, to help you assemble a collection is just foolish. It's, it's, there is that, it, it, it's a wonderful thing. You, you have access to things you never could dream of before, but it, you don't get that thrill of walking into some place and sort of finding hidden treasure, which is, you know, always kind of fun. Well, that, that for sure is true, but, but, but as well, um, you don't get to meet new people. You don't get to have a conversation. You don't get to, ex you know, expand yeah. your uh, uh, knowledge in the act of acquisition. I mean, you, right. you, you, you get it, bring it home, you study it, okay. But, but the, the uh, thrill and the knowledge you get in the act of it is gone. Yeah. Yeah. That's all part of it. It really is. Absolutely. So, so, Glenn, like I said, we're getting a little short on time. I want to, there's so much I could talk to you about. I want to talk, but I do want to talk to you about, um, oh, wait, before we get off the, the topic of the exhibition, we have this. This gorgeous, and I do mean gorgeous, catalog of 221 items. And um, talk, it's available on Amazon. You can see the... Uh, see the link down here before below us now um glenn talk a little bit about this because this is 
a thing of beauty? Well, uh, that, that consumed a substantial part of Kathy and my time for well, well over a year, you know, and it was part, uh, uh, the, the assembly of the uh, catalog was part of the iterative process of what's in the exhibit. As, as uh, uh, you know, we went across adding things, taking things out, as we wrote them up, we said, this is not interesting. You know, we found that we, we, not interesting enough or very frustrating because of the pandemic, uh, we didn't have access to libraries. And, and so we were rel relatively to a normal times limited in the research that we could do. And uh, in some cases, the uh, inability to uh, uh, illuminate uh, things which I'm sure are interesting about some objects, uh, they didn't make the cut in the exhibit because we, 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 we couldn't tell the story adequately. Uh, but but we, worked on, we worked on that for, you know, very hard for, you know, 15 months on the, on the, on the text, on the writing of the text, on making it interesting and compelling and uh, uh, you can tell me how successful it was, but we wanted to make it conversational in tone, as, as if we're talking about, as, as if I'm, you know, describing these objects to you, well, not, not a snooty academic blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, well, I can treats. tell you, it's very, it's very successful. I read the thing cover to cover, and um, it's quite wonderful. I would just say to anybody who can't actually get to the Grolier Club in New York City before April. It ends in April, doesn't it? Yes, I'm not remembering the exact date, but April 16th, the middle of the month. Yeah, mid-April. If you can't get there and see it in person, this is the next best thing to seeing it. And and you can really savor every item and um it's it's quite a it's quite a thing. So um, well thank you. It was, yeah, you're it welcome. was certainly a, certainly a labor of love. And you know, one of the one of the enjoyable parts was um, at the at the, from from my uh, uh, perspective, the very end. I, I the the uh, catalog was printed in Vancouver, and uh, and I took a trip up for the press run, and um, I I brought with me my you know portable with uh, you know very carefully. Um, uh, color tune pictures of everything, and we we color every page that had a color correction applied, so that it's as as accurate as I could make it. Yeah, um, and it's, it's so good, it really is. Yeah, it's well, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. And hats off to Kathy too, because I know she wrote co-wrote it, right? Oh, more than I mean, absolutely. You know, round numbers. Uh, a third of the a third of the catalog uh, uh, I wrote, and then um, uh, Kathy translated it into English. <laughs> and and uh, and she's a wonderful writer. Um, her her formal training is actually journalism. And uh, after that, she she goes, Glenn. Why don't I just interview you? And I'll write the material on the basis of these interviews. So you know, I'm making it up, but to call two thirds of the material in there is the result of, of Kathy quizzing me about you know this book and and why it's interesting and why it's important to me and how it fits in the and so on and so forth. And so uh, uh, she wrote it. You know, two thirds of it were straight. She wrote. It. Well, it's so. Kudos to her too, because it's it's and it's and great. of course we all we all know anybody who knows her is a huge fan. Uh, Janice Fisher did the uh, uh, copy editing editing of it as well, and that's that's why it has no typographical or punctuational or whatever errors in it because of Janice Fisher. Well, that explains that. <laughs> So, Glenn, before we wrap up, I just want to um, quickly touch on, um, you know, you talk about sharing, sharing things and um, the obligation to sort of pass things along. You had a hand in a few years back in the um, discovery and restoration of that German Hound of the Baskervilles film. Is that correct? Well, that and also also in the Gillette film. 
Right. My, my, my involvement in that whole world began with the 1916 uh, Gillette film. Uh, again, it was a Sunday m morning, and uh, Russell Merrick gives me a call. Who I of course you know everybody knows Russell from from uh, Sherlockian circle. Well, ev certainly everybody in the BSI knows Russell from Sherlockian circles. And he calls me up and he says, "Glenn, you won't believe this. Uh, we've found a print of the Gillette film." And um, uh, but suffice it to say, uh, I had. Uh, other than enjoying them, I had nothing to do with the uh, film world, let alone the, the uh, silent film world. And I immediately got drawn into this other group of, of folks who, while the subject matter, so to speak, is entirely different, they are as intelligent, as enthusiastic, as passionate and driven as Sherlockian, but in a different space. Uh, and I had a, a, a wonderful time helping uh, the, uh, with the uh, uh, res preservation and restoration of the Gillette film. And sort of half jocularly, uh, Russell and I and Rob Byrne, who's, who's the uh, president of the San Francisco Silent Film Society, uh, said, well, we have to find another Sherlock Holmes film to do. <laughs> and just a few years later, this this. A, 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 a print of this uh, German film shows up in Poland, and very you know very colorful story. If if uh, I, I it, it's actually quite an entertaining film. It is. Uh, we and, showed it at our Gillette Brett conference, which you came to. That was quite wonderful. And so the and the backstory is just great. You know, it's 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 German production, Czech print. <laughs> found in a Polish archive, it just it couldn't get and and the fellow playing Sherlock in a in a la, in largely in a in a largely European fairly mixed but largely European cat is an American, so it's like what is this? Com how did this combination happen? Well, I mean we know we, yeah. the, 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 the 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 scholars looked into it and found a great deal of information. So no, I've had the I've had the great great pleasure of both becoming involved with this uh, other group of zealots, and in particular the restoration of these uh, two known to have existed once upon a time, but but lost movies. Well, isn't it interesting that you you, you know you, your conversation about the the um, zeal and the passion of the film these film. Um, people that you were drawn in with um, have the same, you know, it's a different space, but it has, has the same kind of uh, passion for its subject matter. But isn't that always kind of the way about people who are passionate when, when they're collecting in a certain area? I know that you also have a passion for the Enigma machine and crypto yes. cryptography. Yes. And, um, is yes, that the same right. there? Is it the same for people who are into that as well? I mean, is there just sort of a camaraderie and passion that kind of brings you all together? Well, there is definitely a, absolutely the same flavor, camaraderie or passion, but there's a, a, a different level of literacy. Not that, not that these folks are not literate and articulate and so on and so forth, but there's a, there's a marvelousness around the, the, the two communities we've talked about because, who knows why because, uh, but the, the easy theory is that they're, uh, uh, they're passionate about these um, non-engineering, non-mathematical, uh, non-war uh, uh, subjects. Yeah. They are lovely. I mean, they're wonderful. And, and I've had endless good time and adventures with them as well and we like each other <laughs> but but there's something different about it it's interesting that's cool well glenn we're about out of time can you believe it i told you it was going to go fast and um i know you're a man of your word so i believe you but <laughs> there's so much i could talk to you about and um i will someday again so um but i want to thank you for coming on the show and um, i just want to encourage everybody 
either visit the exhibition um, or, and if you can't get there or if you see this past its closing date, get the catalog because it is, it's, it's the next best thing to being there. And, um, and it lets you kind of collect Glenn's collection too. And it's uh, to share for it that he, you know, that you're sharing that with everybody is, is, is quite wonderful. You'll see things in there you'll never see anywhere else, if I can tell you that. So thanks, Glenn. I just want to say thanks for being on the show. And uh, take care. Steven, I, thank you very much. I had, I, I had a ball. I look forward thank to seeing you, for you in person. Thank you for again. And that's it for this episode of the Fortnightly Dispatch. I want to say one last time thank you to Glenn. Thanks for being on the show. And also thank you for sharing your treasures with the world. They're quite, quite, quite wonderful. I also want to say thank you to our viewers. Since we were on break, I've had many communications from some of our viewers out there, subscribers asking when we're coming back and looking forward to it and saying how much you have enjoyed the show in the past and expressed hopes that we were indeed coming back. There are also some of you, I was in New York City for the Baker Street Regulars extended weekend. And a number of you actually came up to me and introduced yourselves and said, I watch your show and I want to thank you. It helped me get through the pandemic. And I, the, I don't even have words. That's just wonderful. And I want to say thank you. And um, thanks for sharing that. Um, it means a lot and helps us keep going here. So wonderful. And with that, we'll just say stay safe. Take care of yourselves, and we look forward to seeing you at the next issue, next episode, I should say. That's my publisher talking. Our next episode, uh, where we have another fantastic guest that you'll want to meet. Thank you. Mm -hmm.